Okay, everyone, it's around 12.01, so I think we're going to get started. I hope everyone is having a chance to log in and get ready to ask all kinds of interesting questions and take some good notes. My name is David Brown. Uh, this is a StratCan event. Uh, we're really grateful to have uh, three representatives from the BC government speaking with us today, uh, giving an update on provincial regulations um, with uh, a bit of a focus on the newly announced direct sales model uh, that should be uh, coming into place sometime next year, as well as the farm gate model uh, that the province has been doing some stakeholder engagement with over the past year. Uh, a good portion of our audience today looks to be BC retailers and BC cultivators, uh, especially it looks like we have a lot of micros in BC. Uh, and so I'm really interested to hear their comments and questions. Uh, we'll be hearing from uh, the three representatives will be hearing from Thomas Roger from the LCRB, uh, Fabian Contreras from the BC LDB, and Sarah Cunningham from the Cannabis Secretariat. Uh, they'll each be presenting for around five or 10 minutes, and then we will be opening up the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, I will be reading those questions from the chat, as well as some emails uh, that people have been sending me over the past week. So as uh, the presentation is coming in, feel free to post those questions in the chat. And then around 12.20 uh, or so, we should be able to get into that QA. And I believe all of our representatives from BC will be able to be with us till around 12.50, 12.55 today. So hopefully we'll get a good 30 minutes or so of questions from the audience. Uh, I noticed there's already a couple questions in the QA space as well. So uh, feel free to post them either in the chat or if you look down at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A section uh, where you can post your questions as well. Uh, so with that said, we will just jump right into it if our presenters are ready. Uh, Thomas uh, from the LCRB, are you, uh, are you ready to, to share with us today? Yeah, thanks, David. Appreciate it. And thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting us here and for having a really useful opportunity just to, to continue to engage with, uh, with the industry folks and, uh, and continue to learn and, and develop those relationships. So really appreciate the opportunity. Oh, and thanks to... Uh, Oh, Jessica, for sharing the screen there. I was just going to say, blimey, I'm new to, uh, new to Zoom. And I was like, how on earth am I going to share this screen? That's fantastic. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so Jessica, if we can move to the second slide. Uh, so before we get going, I just want to acknowledge um, that we'll be presenting today, or I'll be presenting today, uh, from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen people, uh, today known as the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations. Um, and actually, I I, I was thinking about this over the weekend uh, in terms of I was uh, out for a walk with my partner and our newborn baby just here in, in Vic West. Um, and my partner reminded me that Thanksgiving's coming up. Uh, and I suddenly realized that Thanksgiving in Canada is probably related to, I'm English originally, uh, it's probably related to an English holiday called Harvest Festival. And it, it just reminded me of historical processes uh, by which many of us will have come here today um, and the great privilege that we have to live on these lands. I just want to give the opportunity for any of the other speakers who uh, might be presenting from different traditional territories, uh, just to acknowledge those. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. This is Fabian, and uh, thanks, uh, Thomas. I was going to uh, acknowledge that uh, I'm not in the same place as, as, as Thomas. I'm, I'm sitting out here in Burnaby, and, and so from there, uh, speaking to you from the uh, ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish nations, and I know I am and, and the LDB uh, uh, as a whole is uh, grateful to be uh, on this shared territory uh, with uh, with uh, with these peoples, uh, these first peoples. So thanks. I'm Sarah here. I uh, Jess and I uh, are on the same territories that uh, Thomas just referenced, and uh, definitely. Uh, this beautiful picture just reminds us of um, how lucky we are to be here. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate it. Um, so, Jess, can we move on to the next slide, please? Thanks very much. Um, so what we wanted to do first, uh, before we get into things, before we get into the detail of the uh, specific cannabis policy items we're here to talk about, uh, we just wanted to give a brief overview of the different arms of government that have a role in the regulation policy development uh, and enforcement of the provincial cannabis regime. Because uh, I, think, I think we all appreciate that from the outside, even sometimes from the inside, government can seem a bit confusing in terms of which arm is doing what and where the divisions are. So I think it's just really useful to, um, to have this quick overview as to where our divides are. 
So really there are four key groups uh, in government who are uh, involved in cannabis regulation. There's those four groups on the screen there. That's the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch, where, where I'm from, the Policing and Security Branch, the BC Cannabis Secretariat, and the Liquor, Liquor Distribution Branch. So I'll give a quick overview of those first two, of the LCRB and the PSB. And apologies, there are a lot of acronyms here. This is, this is, this is how government works and talks. Um, but so that's Liquor and, government, uh, Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch and the Police and Security Branch. And then I'll turn it over to Sarah um, to talk about the Cannabis Secretariat uh, and then Fabian to talk about the Liquor Distribution Branch. So, as I mentioned, I'm from the LCRB. Um, uh, my role at LCRB is uh, manager of policy and legislation, and I have some responsibility for the cannabis files, especially those here in this presentation today. Um, I also have a colleague of mine who's on the line, Leanne Davies, uh, who's also a manager of policy and legislation and who has uh, a responsibility for the cannabis file as well. Um, so what are our key responsibilities as LCRB? Well, chiefly our, our role is to, to regulate the private sale of cannabis in the province. And what that entails is, it's really from start to finish, the licensing, uh, the, the creation of the regulatory framework, the licensing of people uh, under that framework, and then enforcement for licensees. So that's issuing cannabis retail store licenses, um, in processing those applications, deeming if a person is fit and proper, um, including undertaking financial integrity checks, supervising uh, and educating licensees and establishments about cannabis laws and regulations, where necessary, taking enforcement action uh, to ensure that licensees are complying with all of the regulatory and legislative requirements. Um, we, we mandate and provide a training program, it's called Selling It Right, that many of you will likely have taken. Um, and we develop um, non-medical cannabis policy and provide advice to government concerning decisions uh, related to that framework. Uh, as you can tell from our name, we also have a similar function for liquor, for the, uh, for the private uh, retail of liquor in the province, but we'll just stick to cannabis for the time being. So how does that distinguish us from the policing and security branch? Uh, well, the uh, PSB uh, operates the Community Safety Unit, or CSU. These are all acronyms you might come across or, or hear when you're engaging with government uh, in, in the process of your business. And that's responsible for compliance and enforcement um, under the legislation with a focus on illegal cannabis sales. So the LCRB is, is licensing people within the, the legal market and then ensuring compliance there. And the, the PSB and the CSU have a focus on the illegal market or the illicit market. Uh, and they also oversee some parts of the uh, security screening process for private retail licensees. Maybe with that, I'll hand over to Sarah to explain the Cannabis Secretariat. Thanks so much. I almost missed my cue because I was trying to uh, read the Q and A's already. So I should, <laughs> I should not jump ahead of myself. So the Cannabis Secretariat, um, we, play a role in coordinating work across government to make sure government is all pulling together. Uh, there's the players we have uh, articulated here in this slide that we work closely with, but there's also other ministries and branches that have a role in cannabis, like agriculture, advanced education, and health. So you, we help coordinate the work we also do strategic policy on key issues like consumption spaces, which I'll be speaking to later. Uh, a lot of this strategic policy work focuses on figuring out where government wants to go in the future and how we get there. There are two main themes to our strategic work at this point in time. One is legal market competitiveness and the other is indigenous cannabis policy. Another thing that uh, happens out of our shop is the negotiation of sexual and 19 cannabis agreements with indigenous nations. We also do data analysis and monitoring of our progress on legalizing cannabis and meeting government's goals out of this shop. So things like the BC Cannabis Use Survey and the illicit cannabis sample analysis uh, was occurring at, at the Secretariat. That's a high level overview of our work. Fabian? Uh, yeah, okay, I can jump in now on, uh, on the LDB side. So <clears throat> uh, really the LDB is, uh, is the, the sole 
distributor here in in British Columbia. So we operate the provincial monopoly on wholesale distribution uh, of cannabis. So essentially, that uh, when cannabis is um, is, is sold, it, it has to be uh, purchased through the LDB, and then from the LDB, it's where um, private retailers uh, sort of access and purchase uh, product. Uh, it's oversimplifying it, but uh, that's sort of in essence what we are. We're the ones that register uh, cannabis products, so so stuff that's coming on the market that uh, is available in BC uh, has to be registered through us uh, and and properly tracked, and those. Um, and that reporting is done through the LDB. And then we also have uh, a retail component where, where we actually operate as well, a chain of, uh, of cannabis retail stores. I believe the last one, I think we're at 30, if I'm not mistaken, 30 uh, cannabis retail stores across the province. Uh, and so, um, so yeah, so we, we are the ones that uh, in essence uh, are required to, 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 to distribute and, and operate uh, uh, and distribute the uh, cannabis that comes into into the BC market uh, here. And so, yeah, quick overview. Thanks, Fabian. Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate it. Uh, and it probably goes without saying, but maybe it bears saying um, we work really closely together. Although these are these are four different branches of government, we're even under different ministries. Uh, it's necessary uh, in, in in delivering on our mandates that we work really closely together. Um, so there, there are things that I'm working with the Secretariat, and uh, I know I'm always banging on Fabian's door with, with new issues uh, to work through. So um, uh, a lot of collaboration between these teams here. Uh, Jess, can we go on to the next slide? So having set that framework of, of the various different teams that there are at, uh, in, in the government that work on cannabis, uh, we're just gonna walk you through some of the, uh, the, the projects uh, that we're, we're here to talk to you today. So first of all, is this FarmGate program. And this is, uh, this is the, the program that LCRB is chiefly responsible for. Um, so in September 2020, uh, the province announced uh, that we'd be developing a new sales program that would enable quote unquote farm gate sales at a uh, non-medical cannabis nursery or cultivation site. Uh, we expect uh, that program to come into effect in 2022 um, through a, likely through a new license class that, I mean, all of this is subject to some caveat that the decisions, final decisions haven't quite been made, but, but and probably a new license class under the name of something like a production retail store. Um, what we want to do is just give you a very quick kind of overview of, of some of the things that might be reasonably anticipated uh, to be associated with that license class. Um, though, as I say, caveat, final decisions haven't been made on these, on these items quite yet. So the new license class would likely retain many of the features of the current uh, provincial legal framework. It would need to continue operating under the existing federal framework, so there are some existing limitations there. Um, and the provincial framework, we know we've already set up a series of principles for the retail sale of cannabis. So some examples of that might be um, uh, Indigenous nation or local government comments being required for each application, um, the secure storage requirements that we have, um, selling and promoting cannabis to minors. Those kinds of things likely to remain much the same. In terms of who would be eligible for the program, uh, we're looking at standard cultivators, micro cultivators, and nursery license holders. Uh, so that those holding just a standalone processing license wouldn't be eligible for this, this new license class that would enable farm gate sales. In terms of uh, what we've been up to and what our plan is next, um, over the course of this summer, we conducted engagement sessions with, uh, with industry. Um, some of you were likely in those in-person sessions, in those discussion sessions, or, or received the consultation paper we sent out. Um, but for those of you who weren't uh, directly engaged in that, uh, the goal was to understand what these stores could look like, what is viable, um, what, what requirements would be need to be there to make it viable for, the, uh, for applicants, um, and what the expectations are around the farm gate sales. Um, so that, that we, um, we circulated a consultation paper that was sent to industry associations and through, through Health Canada, it was sent to uh, cultivation and nursery license holders. Uh, we received a huge amount of feedback. And for those of you on the call who uh, received that paper, who were engaged in that and who sent back your feedback on your views, it, I think we've said this before, but it, 
it bears repeating. Thank you for that. It, we received a lot of feedback, a huge amount of engagement, um, and it, it's been really valuable in helping us understand the lay of the land, the way that the way the universe looks like um, from from industry, um, and really helping us kind of work out uh, what would be viable here from an industry perspective, um, and what is what is necessary from a government perspective. So we're currently working through those responses, and that will help inform our policy approach. We're doing a lot of policy work, a lot of legal work behind the scenes uh, to really pin down uh, the parameters, the nature of what this farm gate license is. And we expect to be seeking government direction um, on that in early 2022. So at some point, the goal is at some point in 2022, we would be in a position to start accepting applications uh, for this new farm gate license. So that's a quick hop, skip and jump through farm gate. Um, and it would be ignoble for me to, uh, to, to take all the credit or indeed the blame for this. So Leanne, I should note that Leanne on the phone, I mentioned my colleague has done a, a huge amount of work on this um, and, it, and is really the lead for the policy side of things. So I just wanna call out Leanne briefly, um, especially if there are questions on the policy nuance. Uh, but I might leave Farmgate sales there for the moment and uh, hand over to Fabian, to talk about direct delivery. Sorry, I just realized I was on mute and I a few seconds um so yeah I'll, I'll take you through a quick walkthrough in terms of where things sort of are in terms of the direct delivery program and so just wanted to just sort of kind of put a couple of um kind of boundaries around it in terms of sort of some of the objectives this isn't these aren't uh, all of them but some of them uh are really of, of the direct delivery program which uh, part of it is sort of the continuing work that the province is looking to do to continue to eliminate the both the cannabis market and part of that is making or creating other avenues for uh, licensed producers to get their products to market. Uh, there's also the intention of supporting small scale cannabis producers to help them to get into the market. So where uh, there might have been some challenges in terms of accessing uh, central di distribution, um, direct delivery will hopefully provide uh, an opportunity and have an avenue for uh, some smaller cannabis producers to, to hopefully transition and get into the, the, the market. And again, it's also uh, a part of that. It's, it's, it's sort of continuing the support for uh, uh, legal market competitiveness uh, for small scale producers. Uh, next slide. So broadly speaking, what we're looking to do is, is, um, is develop the program um, to support uh, BC based LPs. Uh, and they must meet certain requirements related to federal cannabis licensing and annual production volumes in order to participate. So I'm just going to skip through each of the sort of four broad scenarios in terms of uh, different um, types of producers. So if, you're nur if, you, um, if you have a nursery license, um, uh, you're allowed or you'll be allowed to direct deliver plants and seeds. Those will be, um, as, so as a nursery, you'll just register um, and, uh, with the LDB for that product and, and those products can be directly delivered. Um, there's no sort of uh, cap in terms of size uh, for nurseries. If you're a cultivator and, and hold only a cultivation license, uh, then what you'll what you'll you'll be allowed to direct deliver, but um, you you won't be able to you'll you'll be eligible if you produce three thousand kilograms of of a drip of dry flour or or less. Uh, if you exceed that amount uh, of uh, of production on an annual basis, then uh, then direct delivery is not something that you'll be able to participate in. And part of that is um, the intention of sort of focusing the, as we sort of identified in the objectives, is focusing that program on really supporting small scale cannabis producers. Uh, if you hold a cultivation and a processing license, uh, again, the same sort of eligibility requirements will still apply in terms of the annual production level. Uh, and if you're a processor uh, only license, if you have only a, a processing license, uh, you will be obviously participating in the direct delivery program, but uh, will only be based on eligible cultivators that uh, of which your um, products are are sourced from. Next slide. So, so really, the the kind of this sort of just kind of goes through a bit of a flow in terms of how that direct delivery program or process will work. And so, in the short term, we're looking at what we're what we're pulling together. And part of this is sort of IT requirements and and sort of where we are in terms of what we can do. 
from a technology perspective, some of it is also uh, driven by the sort of desire to want to sort of move forward on on direct delivery sooner and not have to wait until some of those uh, broader IT and, and operational um, uh, requirements are, um, is to have a sales reporting process in the short term. So in essence, the cultivator, uh, a cultivator will apply for direct delivery. Um, what we'll do is uh, verify if the, if the um, cultivator uh, meets the eligibility criteria. So if it's located in BC, appropriate federal licenses are in place, um, sort of verify the production volume uh, requirements. Uh, the cultivator works with a processor, obviously, to create the packaged products. Uh, and then from there, the processor will enter into a supply agreement with the LDB. In some cases, there might or so there might already be um, supply agreements that 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 are in place. And so there'll be uh, that will sort of facilitate perhaps a little bit uh, of an easier process than having to uh, set it up originally. But um, so that might uh, help for those that already have supply agreements with the LDB. Uh, the the processor will register those products um, that are being directly delivered with the LDB. Uh, so a SKU is assigned, the, the price is set, et cetera. Uh, from there, product is, uh, is, is activated and becomes available for sale. Uh, the retailer, in this instance, will order the product from that processor. Uh, um, the processor will then uh, um, sort of collect uh, payment and deliver that product to the retailer. And then the processor will report sales to the LDB uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, once we once LDB receives those reports, the LDB calculates the markup fees, taxes owing, and collects these amounts uh, from the processor. Uh, next slide. Uh, so in terms of next steps, um, LDBs distributed some information on programs to uh, to different stakeholder groups, so cultivators, and processors, and others, um, producers who um, sort of are interested in and in qualify for the program are asked and encouraged to contract or to contact that email so that we can include you in future um, Q and A's and additional information as we sort of flesh out some of the more uh, details of the of the program and how it will operate. Um, there's also a website that we've kind of activated to uh, provide some Q and A's and, and update information as we um, develop more details and, uh, and and want to communicate with folks, and so they can you can keep um, keep updated if you have questions uh, and learn more from that website. And then, really, in the 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 intention is for uh, next year um, to connect with um, in the fall winter of next year to connect with. Uh, those that are eligible and have expressed an interest and, and provide further details on the model and the process itself. So that's just a high overview in terms of where uh, currently things are uh, in, in terms of the LDB's work on direct delivery. So thanks very much. Thanks Fabian. Could you advance to the next slide, Jess? Oh, there we go. Um, so, hi, my name is Sarah Cunningham. I'm, I'll just pop on my video for a second. So, oh, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay, I'm gonna, you'll see my face for the Q and A's, uh, unluckily for you. Um, so the Secretariat is beginning some engagement on non-medical cannabis consumption spaces. So. When I say consumption space, I'm talking about things like paid samplings, tasting rooms, outdoor smoking areas, things like that. Um, this engagement is going to inform a decision by BC on whether it wants to permit consumption spaces, and if so, what that framework uh, might look like. Um, right now, we are doing some engagement this fall with some key stakeholder groups from public health and safety, local government and indigenous groups, as well as cannabis, uh, hospitality and tourism industry groups. The purpose of this preliminary engagement is to make sure we understand some key issues in this space and to help shape the formal engagement that we'll be doing next year in the spring 
which will include uh, public, uh, a broader public and stakeholder engagement. Uh, during this fall piece of work, I, I thought you would be curious to know a little bit about what we're going to be asking the industry associations uh, and the other stakeholder groups. So it's going to focus on three things. One being the, the principles and parameters government has identified to guide the consumption space policy development um, work and the key regulatory provisions that we intend to maintain. For instance, one of those being to maintain um, public health and safety as a, a key priority. So what can we do in this area that would provide additional opportunities to the cannabis industry, but are compatible with public health and safety? Um, one of the provisions that we will be maintaining to this end is not permitting indoor smoking and vaping. So we want to you know, hear feedback on, on issues like this and other um, principles and provisions that we've identified from industry stakeholder groups. Uh, we also wanna make sure that for the broader engagement in the spring, we have done our due diligence in identifying what the risks and potential benefits are of consumption spaces that we will need to capture in the future policy development work that we may be tasked to do. Uh, for instance, one of the key risks we've identified um, is drug-affected driving. So one, and one of the benefits that we've identified is the possibility of strengthening uh, responsible use norms by having consumption spaces that would allow us to, to nudge behavior. So what have we missed? What, what, what have we got right? What have we got wrong? We'll be looking for feedback there. Um, we also wanna hear from the industry groups and other key stakeholder groups, a little bit of their perspective on what we need to consider when developing our formal engagement approach. We wanna make the best use of this opportunity when we go out and talk broadly to um, individuals and businesses through this 2022 piece of engagement work. We, we really wanna get robust information. So we want advice from these industry groups and other stakeholders on how to achieve that. Uh, so this is where my plug is to you folks for uh, if you, if you have strong views about this and you have connections to industry groups, uh, you're represented by them. Um, they, you know, we'll be talking to groups like the Craft Cannabis Association of B BC, um, the Cannabis Cultivators of BC, the Farmers Co-op, uh, Acres. You know, make sure your your uh, views are known to them and. Uh, you also will have a chance to sort of submit more directly to us in the spring. So that's the high level uh, uh, spiel I have for you today and definitely interested in engaging more with you in the Q&A to answer particular uh, questions. Okay, is that everybody, Sarah? Yeah. Great, well, I think uh, if you are ready, then we can just dive into some of these questions. Um, I'm going, I've been kind of reading them through while people have been posting. So I'm going to do my best to go through both the Q&A questions as well as in the chat, um, more or less in order here. Uh, there are a couple that have, have come up several times uh, and one of them, uh, let's see here, one of them at the very top uh, is one that came up uh, several times asking about why processors or at least microprocessors are potentially being excluded from the farm gate model. And so I'll just read this one out, although like I say, it's referenced several other times in the chat as well. Uh, so someone posts micro cultivators. Uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry, this is a different, <laughs> different one. Uh, there are many micro cultivation facilities are located far from city centers and have limited staff and are shoestring operations. 
many micros have asked if their processor could sell FarmGate for them as they do not want the hassle. Why have the processors been excluded? Uh, by excluding processors, you have excluded many other products like topicals, resins, edibles, et cetera. Uh, how do you view this as different from uh, say an artificial soap maker, pottery maker, or cheese maker? Uh, and why can these products not be sold by FarmGate by a processor? Thanks, David. So I think that's one for LCRB. Um, though it's an interesting and a really valuable question. Um, and I think it also gets at the kind of the breakup of uh, how how these things are spread across government, because I might also invite Sarah to comment on um, the initial strategy behind this as well. Um, but one of the purposes of the FarmGate uh, initiative project um, is to support BC grown uh, non-medical cannabis and BC growers and through that rural development. And so the focus has really been on those cultivators um, rather than the standalone processes. Of course, that's not to say that those who are who hold a cultivation license plus a processing license on the same location would be excluded. They wouldn't. They're, they're eligible because they have that cultivation license. Um, it's only if you're a processor alone, that's the, only on your site, um, where um, uh, you, you wouldn't be eligible for this. Um, in terms of the, the products that are eligible for sale, um, I would say decisions haven't been finalized on that yet as to which products are eligible for sale through the PRS. Um, so appreciate the feedback and we'll take that on board. Um, Sarah or Leanne, if you're able to speak, is there anything you want to add in there on the, the rationale for uh, limiting this to cultivators? So yes, like as you said, it's cultivators or cultivator processors. Um, I think the one piece to add is that we understand that it's not going to be a feasible business model for many of the rural um, cultivators or cultivator processors. Um, that's where direct delivery would come into play as potentially a, a better way of ensuring that your product stays in your community um, without actually requiring you to have a farm gate site. So it would allow you to be in control of where your product was sold and where what we heard in our initial engagement is that many of the cultivators wanted to have their products sold in their community or region. And direct delivery would enable that. To that end, is there anything, Fabian, that you'd like to add? No, I, I think I think you've covered it. I, I just I think the importance of, of I think everybody knows and I think just in reflecting understands I think the importance that um, the processors have in in the entire sort of supply chain, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't. There's I, the, the the I think the programs themselves are. There's a bit of a obviously a an, an interesting challenge in terms of how the entire regime is structured at a federal level and these distinctions between sort of cultivators and what they can do and processors and what they can do and and I I think the programs themselves and the, really the intention of this sort of this uh, kind of uh, work is really in in support of. Of, of local cultivators, making sure that um, there's an opportunity for them uh, as best as possible to access the market. And also, uh, you know, as, and I'm speaking sort of out of term here perhaps, but on the farm gate perspective as well, you know, encouraging uh, opportunities to sort of profile the kind of local uh, kind of products that exist um, and, and an avenue for, for that to exist through through farm gate. So so, so it, I know it's maybe not satisfactory to, to everybody, but but uh, from a policy intent perspective, that's sort of where uh, where these sort of changes we hope will will help to sort of make some gains. David, you're on mute. You're on mute, David. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Anyone help else have anything to add there, or is that uh, cover it for you guys? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, that's the okay, good. Yeah. I wasn't sure if I didn't have the, the right status on the on the as a presenter. I think the only other thing that I'd like to add is that, you know, as we've been doing as we did the engagement in the summer and and as we are, you know, having this conversation now and seeing the feedback, um, you know, this is another opportunity for us to get more information about the industry and to take that back to decision makers. You know, the Farmgate program itself isn't gonna solve all of all, isn't going to work for every business, right? It's not going to be uh, 
it's, it's not going to be viable for every single business in BC. And we're hoping that with FarmGate and with direct delivery that we're able to support a number of businesses across the province. Uh, and in those situations where it's not effective is, you know, we still have the ability to take the information that you're providing us now and that we received in the summertime uh, and put that forward. Uh, in terms of developing this program, the focus has, or at least for, for the for the LCRB component, the farm gate component, it has been focused on that concept of farm and and with the um, with the product that's being produced at that site being then sold at that site, not being sold elsewhere. Uh, so that's one of the key premises behind farm gate, recognizing that that isn't going to work for everybody, but we are trying to. Uh, to hit that segment of the market now, and we can take away the other information that we've been provided and, and report that up. You're on mute again. You'd think I would have figured this out by now. Uh, I just had one follow-up on that myself. Uh, and I know that there was a mention earlier that all the details on the um, PRS licensing aren't really dialed in yet, but I was wondering if anyone can speak to that a little bit more in terms of the direction you're looking for what those rules might look like for a farm gate store as they compare to the current uh, provincial retail regulations. So for example, um, some of the requirements around the type of building and is, uh, are you looking at the possibility for trailers or sea cans or, or uh, maybe less capital intensive retail settings for those uh, farm gate uh, PRS licenses as you're referring to them? Uh, I think, David, if it's okay, we might have to be a bit cagey on that because th those decisions haven't been made and the analysis is still ongoing. Um, but I, I think what we can say is that we received a lot of very valuable feedback and a lot of very detailed feedback through those multiple different routes that we took over the summer. And as Leanne mentioned, that's that's all been putting into the, the meat grinder that is the government policy. Um, so uh, I'm afraid we can't be more specific about at the moment, but when we're able to communicate out about it, um, we will be looking to do so. Yeah, I think I'll just add to that as well that uh, we're looking at as much as possible, like given the the breadth of responses that we received from the from the people who submitted their their responses to our to our engagement and the the online engagement that we had or the the, the calls that we had, um, you know, we're looking to make this program as flexible as possible uh, to work for as many. Uh, cultivators and nurseries as as we can. Um, so with so uh, so to give you to like the peek behind the curtain in the sense of like how the analysis is being done is it is you know one of the first things we did was look at what a can what the, what is the cannabis retail store model in BC and what are all of the different requirements you know we're we we are restricted by the federal requirements, like we're not in a position to change those, unfortunately. So that does result in some restrictions to the way this will look. Uh, but at the same time, you know, everything that is for a cannabis retail store, we've been looking at that with a critical lens of does that make sense for a farm gate uh, production store? And, you know, in the sense of, you know, even asking the question of, okay, that that federal production site is uh, a secure site. So what are the requirements for security for a store that might be located on that site versus if you have a large property and your store is located, you know, adjacent to your federal production facility and like not in that secure site, um, what would the security requirements be there, for example? So, you know, we're trying to look at this in, in the lens of you know, what makes sense to ensure that we are meeting our mandate in making sure that the, you know, for ensuring public health and safety uh, for this regulated product, but at the same time, trying to make this program as flexible and viable as possible so that the, the most people can take part. So our next question is from Carrie Lohr. Uh, what will happen when a cultivator exceeds the 3,000 kilograms if they are already registered to participate in the direct delivery program? Uh, have you seen in this as an issue in the liquor environment uh, and grandfathering? Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll take that uh, question uh, on direct delivery. Um, so, so right now, there is no sort of obviously direct delivery program that's been put in place. And 
uh, some cultivators um, we know sort of produce and, and cultivate more than what the eligibility and, and the threshold requirement will be. And so uh, when, uh, when cultivators sign up for direct delivery, uh, they'll be required to sort of uh, indicate that uh, sort of how much that production level is. And we're sort of still working through some of the details in terms of, in terms of how uh, that information is collected and validated. And that's all part of the ongoing discussions. Um, but there is no sort of intention at this point, uh, to Gary's point, to sort of do any sort of grandfathering, if you will. And I think what she's referring to is, uh, is if there's, if there are some that perhaps uh, met a requirement that existed before, uh, and those change, will they be accepted? Well, within direct delivery, it's never existed. Uh, so there's no sort of grandfathering, because there was no sort of um, system in place for it to begin with. So so I hope that uh, answers that question. Fabian, I think it's more about what happens when the program's up and running and somebody uh, starts oh, off as eligible I, and then- Okay, I, I yeah. see what you mean. So if it's, so if you've, if you've exceeded the production level. Yeah. Um, so so the, the program itself right now will be, um, is, is sort of set at that level. Uh, there's no intention at this point to sort of look further. I mean, I, we know that like as, as programs unfold and you start looking at how they've been doing and you evaluate them, you, you take a look to see if they're still meeting the, the policy objectives. Part of that, um, you know, 3000, uh, even that uh, threshold amount is sort of a, and, and there's been some discussions and, and maybe Sarah can speak to this uh, when there was discussions on this earlier when there was consultations uh, a year or so ago, but it's it's sort of, it, it's obviously it exceeds the amount of what you would find within a micro license, uh, but it's not quite as much as, as a standard license. And it's sort of trying to sort of balance even within that amount that, that, that there's sort of a range that, that would sort of be appropriate, not just for different types of production, uh, whether you're indoor or outdoor, but also uh, to be able to sort of kind of create that sort of a buffer between um, the small micros and, and those that are sort of maybe interested in growing a little bit, but they're not as sort of large as some of the standard processors. So, so, so right now, if, if, if there's a, if there's sort of, you know, if you exceed that production level, then, then you won't qualify and then direct delivery is no longer going to be an option for you now. Whether or not that gets reevaluated in the future is to be seen. Our next question uh, is about uh, collection of provincial fees. So shifting gears a little bit, um, <clears throat> person asks, in Manitoba, it is collected at, uh, the excise tax is collected at point of purchase and cultivators and processors only have to pay 25% gram upon delivery to retailers. Why has BC decided to collect it upfront from LPs rather than at retail? By collecting it upfront, it means that the excise is marked up by 15% at retail and then one and a half times by retailers turning 350 in excise to $6 to consumers? And is there an opportunity to adopt this uh, Manitoba model as an example? So, so I'm, I'm not, uh, I'll, I'll maybe provide a bit of a broad response to this. I don't know if it's gonna be uh, satisfactory, but um, from, this is just from my understanding and, and, and perhaps um, others might, might be able to weigh in, but, but Manitoba's approach is a bit of a, a, a different, it's sort of a deviation from uh, most other provinces, as I understand it. It's not, it's not quite the same. And they entered into a, a different agreement with the feds uh, when it came to, um, when it came to cannabis uh, at the time when, when cannabis became legalized. And um, the method that, that the BC applies is sort of, I guess the more standard approach, I think uh, would be maybe fair to say um, introduced through CRA, but I'm certainly not uh, as an expert in terms of the, 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 the those particular differences. So, but that's what I understand it. So, so for us to have to kind of move to that approach would probably require um, a renegotiation of of an agreement with the feds. Uh, it could impact a, a, a bunch of different factors. So I don't know if um, at this point uh, this is the system that exists and and is available in BC, and and so. Uh, appreciate the the comment, but uh, it's not something that's going to be changing. 
Uh, so shifting gears again, there's a question from Lane Keys. Uh, could we please get an update on the Indigenous Shelf Space Program? Hi, um, this is Sarah Cunningham. I have been working on the Indigenous Shelf Space Program and what I can tell you right now is that we're working with the First Nation Leadership Council Working Group on questions of eligibility and um, process for applying and managing the program. Once we have got um, uh, consensus or, or once th these us and uh, the FNLC working group are comfortable with um, the program, we will be looking to launch it and we're anticipating uh, launching it uh, this year. So here's uh, another one that's come up in the chat and the QA uh, asking, what is the number of unlicensed stores that the CSU has shut down in the first two years as an organization in British Columbia? Um, I don't know that offhand. I don't know if any of the other speakers on the, the call have that information. Uh, no, I don't, I don't, as, I don't either. Um, I know that it's reduced, <laughs> but Jess, did you have something to add? Yeah, I was just gonna say that that's uh, community safety unit isn't on this call today. So we don't have that exact number. That's something that would have to come from them. So our next question, will the LDB ever implement a product call or RFP in order to help build out product offerings and give LPs better direction to what needs are of the market? So I guess I, 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 I don't know if I've, I'm, I'm going to be able to answer that question directly. We, that would be uh, part of our supply chain folks and, and they manage it. I know that um, there's some differences in terms of how, um, in, in, for example, in Ontario, where they do a call and, and, and at this point in time right now, I don't, I don't think there's any changes that are being uh, contemplated, but, but it's not sort of my bailiwick. So so sorry, I can't get uh, too much in terms of that for you. No problem. So another one that's come up, I see in front of me here, and it's come up a lot is uh, different forms of the same question asking about the reasoning behind keeping the 15% processing fee uh, for direct sales when the LDB is not warehousing those products. So, yeah, so that, that's sort of in reference to the provincial markup. And so I think just important to understand that the LDB, sort of as we set out at the beginning, is the wholesale, the sole wholesale distributor of non-medical cannabis in, in, in the province. And so part of that is regulating, this responsibility of regulating the distribution of cannabis, its alignment with the province's sort of health and safety objectives. Um, the province, is, in essence, takes title to cannabis under um, that sort of distribution framework, that legal distribution framework that we have in BC and applies a proprietary charge in the form of, of the wholesale markup to support those objectives. So the markup applies, um, markup that's applied to cannabis in BC provides sort of flexibility for the province to sort of address these public health and safety objectives, including, um, you know, you know, as at the same time as sort of facilitating um, the proper sort of distribution consideration of, of, of the pressures that it puts on um, the cannabis uh, legal and, and the illegal market and the, comp the competition that sometimes that exists within that space. So, so, so while I, I you know, I, I hear you that, that there's sort of concerns and, and, and issues around the, the markup itself. At this point, there's no uh, change that's being made. That markup will continue to apply on products that are delivered uh, centrally through LDB and those that are uh, delivered under the direct delivery program. So our next question is from Laura Ringwood. Is there another technology platform you will consider to use outside of the LDB warehouse wholesale or in unison with this platform for the direct delivery program and to help with the registration for SKUs with the LDB for these direct sales and overall reporting? Again, this one's a little bit outside my 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 bailiwick in terms of the, but but the the registration process is um, 
is going to stay the same at this point. The way we're going to operate direct delivery, as I said before, is a bit of a, in the short term, we're looking at this sort of, as I just sort of described it, this sort of sales reporting process where the sales will happen and then and then the processor will report essentially what those sales are and, and then the application of the, the fees, the markup taxes will be applied uh, after that. Uh, and so it's, it's uh, and some of that is, you know, ideally, I think LDB would want to move more to a sort of a central ordering process, a system that's you know, a little bit more automated and, and provides a bit more functionality and, and more immediate sort of functionality to sort of uh, sort of do some of those, uh, have some of those transactions in place. We're just not there yet. And, and that's something that uh, that we're looking at, but it's still a number of years down the road. So here's another question from the chat. What's the percentage of products on each PO that the BCLDB can keep for its retail branch? As a retailer, we have no knowledge of what, when, how many is available. How come there are instances of products being available at BC Cannabis Store, but not on the wholesale website? I actually am not sure. I, I actually don't have an answer to that question. I'd have to take that back. Couple times, so I'll ask again. Will Farmgate stores be able to sell other BCLP products in Ontario? Two Farmgate stores open there so far, are selling other Ontario products. Uh, Thrive is selling other craft products. Um, Eds is selling co-op partner products. If uh, not in BC, why not? Yeah, and I think I mean I think that we've hit on the you know we need final government decision, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the intention is to make this a viable option for for cultivators. So if that, I guess, my, my, sort of the, the circular answer is if selling the only your own product is not a viable option, which it doesn't necessarily seem like it would be for many of the small producers, given the, the small amount of product that they do produce each year, that um, consideration will be given to to broadening that. It sounds like, you know, you, you've answered a few of these questions. It sounds like you're saying that there's still some opportunity for industry to uh, shape this a bit and you guys are still taking feedback. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the, the more feedback we get, the better. Um, our sort of like formal consultation period was during the summer, but we're always interested in hearing more from industry. I think that there's um, a lot of value in um, folks sort of coming together and and you know, presenting their their thoughts, opinions um, collectively to government, because I think that um, it can be challenging for that, you know, just one voice of many to be heard. Um, so opportunities like this, or um, if there's any, you know, official sort of, what's the word I'm looking, industry organizations that if anybody's a part of, um, putting forward sort of a joint submission to government is another great way um, to do that. We can um, put our contact email in the in the chat here. Um, maybe Monica can do that. I think she's on the call as well. Uh, and yeah, if, you, if you're able to sort of put them together, it's really great. But otherwise, we're also interested in hearing things um, in chats like this. I know that's something StratCan is working on. And we've been talking to a lot of the, the BC micros uh, and, and we'll be. So if anyone else wants to reach out to us on that work, we're, we're hoping to consolidate some of that feedback for the BC government as well. Awesome. Can I just briefly add to that to say, um, as I mentioned during the presentation, we are looking at finalizing this direction uh, early in the new year. So, so the window is slightly closing. So I, that's, that's by way of encouraging people, if you want to provide a view here in the way that Leanne suggested, then mm -hmm. um, I, I'd get on it. Um, <laughs> but also to emphasize that our consultation paper was circulated um, through Health Canada to um, uh, all, all cultivator license holders. Um, and, and some of those who are Indigenous affiliated who are also in the chain um, in, in the application process for one of those licenses. So hopefully you should have received the, the, the formal consultation through that, through that way as well. So we're running up close on time. How are all of our presenters? Uh, do you guys need to get going or do you have a couple more minutes? Uh, I, I have to get going pretty quick, but I, I think just quickly, I just wanted to kind of reflect back on that question that, that was asked around um, purchase orders and BCLDB. I, a little bit, I think maybe I was a little bit thrown off and confused in that one in the sense that um, 
all products that are listed are available to BC cannabis stores and others. And if there's an issue where maybe perhaps it, just thinking about it more, if, if, if there was an issue where perhaps there was uh, some product not available, it might've been that it was at some point sold out. Um, but but the, the stuff that's available uh, on, on cannabis wholesale is available to all retailers, so. If I uh, could squeeze in one last question, if you guys have time, I noticed something that came up a lot in the chat was asking about um, the delivery options that are currently available for retailers and what, if ever, uh, if there is an opportunity for allowing those retailers to ship a product or mail product rather than, than deliver them. Sorry, can I just ask you to repeat that one more time? Yeah, one of the questions that came up in the chat a lot was asking about the current delivery model for retailers uh, right. and if there's an option, if there's any opportunity to ship that policy uh, to allowing retailers to ship a product or, you know, use the mail, uh, mail product directly to consumers. Right. And I, you know, I think this is one of those interesting topics because you know, the, the delivery model was, was just launched in the, in July. Um, and we're sort of seeing how, how all of this rolls out. Uh, and, you know, taking into consideration, like what are, what, what we're trying, uh, how do I say this? Uh, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can in terms of trying to ensure that, you know, businesses in BC who are working in the cannabis industry have opportunities to, to grow and to, you know, create like a vibrant industry. And, you know, we're constantly looking at all of these different regulations that are in place um, and, and trying to figure out what the best mechanisms are to, to make it viable for the businesses while also ensuring that we're upholding our mandate. So, so questions around delivery, like we're, it's, it's sort of like a constant there are lots of things on our plate <laughs> is like the broad way of putting it. So I don't have the answer of like, yes, we are going to be doing this, but I do have the answer of, you know, the, the LCRB, the secretary at the LDB, we're constantly looking at um, where the barriers are. We're hearing things from industry and it's been really great to be able to hear things from industry more in the last few months, especially related to this farm gate engagement. And as, as the industry is maturing, so is you know the regulatory environment. So uh, this is one of those things that you know, I could, we can take this feedback. We can I can encourage you as well to work with the associations that are um, in place and and provide this in a formal way, and and we can do our our work in terms of um, developing the policy uh, for various initiatives in BC. Okay, well, I think we're, we're running up on time here and I know our attendees probably have other meetings they need to rush off to. I've tried to get to as many of the questions as possible. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, they uh, have posted their email in the chat. Uh, I believe it's lcrb.outreach at gov.bc.ca. Again, my name is David Brown. Uh, this has been a StratCan production really uh, grateful to all the representatives from the BC government today, from the Secretariat, from the LCRB and the LDB for taking time out of their day to talk to us about these programs and to field questions. Uh, and we hope to speak with everyone again very soon. It's a pleasure. Thanks, David. Thanks for the invite. And thanks to everyone for attending.